Thank you so much, Brent. I'm really excited today. I love our weekends where we get library lecturers or other people in that give us a unique opportunity to do an interview in the class. It's a fun way to learn some things, to be edified, and to get to know someone that you wouldn't get to know otherwise. So this weekend, for example, we have Dr. Trimper Longman, and I'll bring him up here in just a moment. He and his wife, Alice, are here and uh, seated down here on the second row with Charles and Kay Mickey and my sweet wife, Becky and Lorraine and whomever else. Well, that's it on that row. So uh, uh, anyway, we're delighted to have him get to interview him. We'll have another one coming up in November. We'll have John Piper in here for an interview. And so you can start looking forward to that as well. That'll be one of those where we pull out the bleachers um, uh, because there's a, a, a number of folks who want to come to the lecture that aren't going to be able to that'll come here. And so uh, if we're excited about that as well. Just plan. These are unique opportunities to hear some, from some pretty special people in ways you don't otherwise. I almost did a panel interview this morning because we have a number of great scholars that you'd love to hear from. Steve Ortiz is sitting back there with Bob Seifert. Steve, stand up so they can see you. Steve is an archaeologist who digs over in Israel. He teaches at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, friend of the class, friend of the library, and uh, always delightful to have Steve. And then Lawson and Kathy Younger, y'all stand up, Lawson and Kathy. Kathy, right here. What? What did I say? I've heard it both ways. Um, like, oh, you brought Patty this time. Oh, Patty, I apologize. I've got Kathy on the brain because of the next one I'm introducing, Jim and Kathy Hoffmeyer, and my brain's just short-circuited. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, we have Lawson and Patty Younger. And they're down here from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School up uh, outside of Chicago. And if you need some practice reading cuneiform, uh, uh, he is your guy. And he uh, has helped us, friend of the library, friend of the class, and a friend of ours. And it's an honor to have you all here as well. And then Jim and Patty Hoffmeyer. Oh, wait. No, it's Kathy Hoffmeyer. Where are Jim and Kathy? Are they here somewhere? There, ah, there they are. Hey, Jim, can you chant Hebrew? What? You chant. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Very well played. Well, it's fair for him. He's an Egyptologist, a uh, friend of the class, friend of the library, and he and Kathy, uh, uh, great folks. Great to have you guys down here, uh, and uh, just an honor to have you all. So, I want to bring Trimper Longman up here to join me. Will you all join me in welcoming Trimper? Trimper, have a seat. All the right. water is fresh. Thank you. And uh, we are going to have some fun. I've got your interview divided up into a couple of different areas. The first one is the easy one. What's the meaning of life? No, it's, uh, <laughs> Actually, um, <laughs> I have an answer to that. <laughs> I let you Ecclesiastes has yeah. an answer to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to start out. I want them to get to know you a little bit. Sure. So tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, um, I'm Tremper Longman the third, uh, the son of Tremper Longman Jr., the father of Tremper Longman the fourth. But in any case, uh, uh, I um, am a biblical scholar. I just retired from my full-time teaching position at Westmont College, where I was the Robert Gundry Professor of Biblical Studies for 19 years. And before that, I taught for 18 years at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And uh, I'm going to continue uh, writing, and I'm going to continue teaching, but as a more independent scholar, though Westmont named me Distinguished Scholar, they asked me what I wanted to be called. I thought Distinguished Scholar would be cool, but... Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's, yeah. yeah. Next to Field Marshal, it's yeah, one of my field, favorite I titles. I thought about the, the right reverend, whatever, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm not ordained. Um, so... I've been studying the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern studies, though Lawson's cuneiform is much better than mine at this particular point. And, um, and of course, I'm married to Alice, whom you introduced, and we have three sons and four granddaughters. And I won't mention the football team I'll be rooting for this afternoon in this company. 
Um, yeah, that's probably best. That's probably best, though the internet may like it. Um, all right, so you've written 30 books or so. Something like that. What's your favorite one? That's like asking who's your favorite kid, right? No, we have no trouble with that in our family. <laughs> <laughs> it's whoever we're talking to yeah, at the exactly. moment. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. that's true. So uh, it's my most recent book then. <laughs> okay, good, good. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I started writing early in my career and felt it was a real important aspect of my work. And, um, yeah, the, my most recent book, The Fear of the Lord is Wisdom About Wisdom Literature, is one I'm currently very excited about, though I'm also excited about the one I'm currently writing. All right. We'll get to what you're currently writing in a moment. Yeah. If someone were to, say, uh, categorize your books. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Give us the categories you've written in. Sure, sure. I, um, I, I very, again, very early in my career, I remember said I was working on the New Living Translation and every summer they'd bring us to some resort where we'd work from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. and they'd allow us to bring our wives and they'd be having fun all day and we'd join them after 2 o'clock and have fun the rest of the day. But one year Alice and my sons were unable to come and I remember sitting in this nice restaurant in Beaver Creek, Colorado. It was summer. Uh, still cool in Beaver Creek in summer. but. And I just started jotting down what I wanted to do in my writing career, and I thought, I'm going to write for three different audiences. I'm going to write for scholars. I'm going to write for sort of what <laughs> the professional class, namely pastors and seminarians. And I'm also going to write with lay, for lay people. So I've tried to have a project going with for each of those categories, and they kind of overlap at times. But then another way to think about I've thought about the writings is I, um, I write a lot of commentaries, and that's mostly for the seminary pastor crowd, you know, so that they can have help as they prepare for their sermons, but also some of my commentaries are for lay people, and scholars are interested in, in some of them as well. Uh, but I also write books that help people understand how to interpret the Old Testament and the relevance for their lives. And so, for instance, I've written a series of books for the IVP, and I'm still writing uh, one right now called How to Read. So I have a book called How to Read Psalms, How to Read Exodus, How to Read Genesis, etc. And then another aspect is I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. So early in my career, I got into what's called the literary approach to biblical interpretation, which was taking literary categories to try to understand the way that Hebrews told their stories, which is different than the way we tell our stories. And so knowing some of the conventions of Hebrew storytelling help us understand what we're reading. And the same thing with poetry. And then I've done a lot of work with a counselor psychologist named Dan Allender, who happens to be in town preaching in, in Ecclesia uh, this morning downtown. But Dan and I have written a series of books combining his interests in, uh, well, his counseling expertise and my biblical expertise. And it actually was, sorry, this is a long answer, but in 1984, I called him yesterday. He's downtown. He lives in Seattle. But I called him and I said, what happened in Houston 33 years ago? And all of a sudden it hit him. Oh, that's when Larry Crabb and Dan Allender invited me and my colleague Ray Dillard down to critique their use of the Bible in a seminar that they were giving on, you know, on life. And we ended up feeling our lives were critiqued by their teaching. So at that point, we started talking about collaborating. So Houston plays a very important place in our relationship. And then finally, lately, I have been doing a lot of interdisciplinary work with scientists on, on science faith issues. And most recently, uh, I co-edited co uh, Dictionary of Christianity and Science. So, <clears throat> do you watch a lot of TV? Actually, actually, my wife will test to you that I do. 
I watch uh, no. uh, Game of Thrones. You made an allusion to that last night. Uh, I probably shouldn't admit that, though. <laughs> I, I, I do not admit to watching that either um, in here. Uh, <laughs> often. <laughs> All right. So um, within the framework of this, mm. you've got a couple of books that, that I, I, I want to talk about if we've got time. But before we do that, I want to get into some of your lecture last night. Now, uh, you have written and, and have been a student of divine violence. And by that we mean uh, this idea that God, as a warrior God, is someone who can <clears throat> tell the Israelites to go destroy every Amalekite or every mm -hmm. person in Jericho or every, you know, man, woman, and child mm -hmm. at times. And yet we read in the New Testament, Jesus says, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a period of 2,000 years, the church has struggled to try and understand if those are one and the same God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are they? Yes, they are. And, but let me say that I understand why we struggle with this Old Testament idea, but we also, as I'll s explain in a moment, it's not just an Old Testament idea. Um, it's also a New Testament idea in that uh, what we see in the Old Testament is God using Israel as what Jeremiah calls the tool of his anger. In other words, the tool of his judgment. They're not doing it on their own. They're bringing judgments against the Canaanites. Uh, Genesis 15, I think it's verse 6, when God is talking to Abraham, he says, this land is yours, but not yet until the sin of the Amorites is full. And so, uh, as I explained last night, in the Old Testament, you have many accounts of God using Israel to bring judgment against others, but also God using others, most notably the Babylonians, to bring judgment against Israel when they're sinful. So, the connection that I see in the Old Testament when it comes to divine violence is uh, you know, connection between uh, this and judgment. Now, when we come to the New Testament, uh, it's true that there's a transition, but it's not as if, as I said last night, God had anger, manage, uh, ma uh, anger management counseling in the intertestamental time period. There's a heightening and intensification of warfare so that during the period of time between the first and second coming of Christ, the battle is directed toward the spiritual powers and authority, and that battle is won by killing, not by dying. And of course, Ephesians 6.10 and following, put on the whole armor of God, you know, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers and authority, and therefore our weapons are faith and prayer and things like that. But then the New Testament also tells us that Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, the picture we get, say, in Mark 13 or Revelation 1 is that he's riding a cloud. Now, this is not a white, fluffy cloud. We often picture when Christ is riding a cloud that it's some kind of white, fluffy cloud that's kind of an ethereal elevator, and many of you have seen that picture from probably the 50s of Jesus wearing a nice white robe, holding a nice white fluffy lamb on a white cloud, looking very peaceful. Uh, and so, but that's not the picture the Bible gives us. When God in the Old Testament or Jesus in the New Testament is on the cloud, it's a storm cloud. This comes from ancient Near Eastern storm god imagery. Or Revelation 19, 11 and following, he's riding a horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. And he's talking about final judgment. It's what the pastor was talking about this morning, right? He was talking about final judgment. And it's just the case that some of my good friends in the church, other scholars, are 
beginning to kind of try to retool traditional doctrines, not just on divine violence, but on the doctrine of hell as well. All right. So two things I want to insert here. Uh, one insert, and then I want to take a step from where you've, you've taken us. Uh, my insert would be, for those of you who want a visual image of Jesus coming on the clouds, if you do go back into other uh, literature from the ancient Near East, you, you've got, you know, clouds, storm clouds were wonderful images for the mm -hmm. gods coming because of the rumble of the thunder. Mm -hmm. But they also are illustrative of if you see in the battlefield someone coming in a dusty battlefield, the horse that they're riding in on is going to kick up a dust mm. cloud. Mm. And we of all people out in Texas ought to be able to <laughs> get that image. That's what it is. It's the army coming mm. where you see the dust cloud that's coming preceding the army before mm. the army's that visible. You see that cloud coming from the distance. You can hear the hoof beats. And that's why the ancients would equate, especially in that dusty world, mm. would equate the thunder with uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the god of thunder, their uh, Thor equivalent. Fair? Yeah, fair, fair. All fair. right. Now, here's, here's my question. I've put on the Elmo, and if you all will pull the Elmo up, you can see it down on the monitor there, except that monitor is kind of shifty. So you need to look at this monitor. All right. The real would you agree with me, the reality of existence, uh, just a true reality of existence, is sin brings judgment. Yes. I mean, it, this, this is true. We'd love it to be different, yeah. but, but haven't we been warned about this since the garden? Yeah. Did God do his part in warning us? Yes. I'm trying a case right now, but yeah. one of my complaints <laughs> is the people who made the defective part didn't warn people. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Did God warn? He warned. Okay. Gave us a choice. Yes. Okay. Is the God of the Old Testament a God where we see sin bringing judgment? Yes. Is the God of a New Testament a God where we see sin bringing judgment? God of the New Testament. Do we see sin bringing judgment? Yes. New Testament or Old Testament. Isn't that the whole story of the cross? Yes. This is God bringing judgment yeah. upon sin. Right, right. So Jesus bears the brunt of violence on our behalf. He didn't die a peaceful death. No. And it was forecasted thousands of years thousands before. Thousands of years before, right. Okay. All right. So now let's get into the nitty-gritty, though. That, that, if God's going to do that through Jesus, why does he wait and do that through Jesus then as opposed to doing that through Jesus before he kills all the men, women, and children of Jericho? Well, it's not as if the men, women, and children, well, the men, women, the children, that's a whole nother very difficult question, don't have an option to accept the God Yahweh. I mean, we, we, I think some people misunderstand the Old Testament as some kind of ethnic cleansing, as if uh, the Canaanites, they were just going to be executed no matter what. Um, but the story of Rahab is probably the most dramatic story of a Canaanite becoming a worshiper of Yahweh and being spared, and, and her, whoever was in her house when they came, went to her house out of faith that it was going to be judgment from Yahweh. So, and then we don't get a lot of stories like that, but we have a lot of names of, of um, Canaanites later in Israelite history, which… Ruth. Helps, yeah, well, Ruth, yeah, Ruth is uh, another example of a Gentile becoming a part of the covenant community, or Uriah the Hittite, or Shamgar, this judge who kind of appears in one verse at the end 
of the story of, just before the story of Deborah, it's clearly uh, a non-Hebrew name, and, and on and on and on. So, and the other thing is, as I mentioned last night, it's, it's not as if, if Canaanites fled before the Israelites and left the land that they kind of hunted them down. Um, yeah, so... Um, so, so we got to read the narrative carefully. We have to read the narrative carefully, always, always read it carefully. And, and you know, unfortunately, certain cultural things, shall I mention veggie tales, don't help us all the time in terms of <laughs> we start I thinking of the, Nebuchadnezzar the, as a carrot or something. Don't knock veggie tales. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, I'm just sorry. Telling yeah, you. yeah, that's... Uh, no, Lawson Younger was speaking yesterday at lunch, and Lawson said that some of our biggest problems with these stories, and one of the things that we've tried to do in this class to rectify is the images that we have in our head yeah. from growing up in the church, watching Veggie Tales or having the, the, the classes that we do is one of, you know, this monster Jericho where the right, walls come right, tumbling exactly. down and you read the text and that's not really what the text is necessarily saying right. in that sense. Yeah, and... Uh, and Lawson has contributed greatly to the question and has shown us that, you know, Joshua 1 through 12 utilizes a lot of what we would call hyperbole today, which was typical in the ancient Near East. We got to read the Old Testament. When we're reading it really seriously and we're addressing questions like this, I'm not saying we have to do this every time we read it devotionally or something, but when we encounter questions like this, we got to remember that the Bible wasn't written uh, to us. It was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. And in other words, every book of the Old Testament was originally written to a specific audience at that particular time period. They don't call the book of Romans, for instance, Romans for nothing. You know, it's because it's a letter written to the church at Rome. And every single Old Testament book has a particular audience of mine. And that's why, and I know I'm sounding like the scholar I am, <laughs> but that's why to really got understand. a lot of nerds in here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could see that looking out. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you need to watch more TV. Okay, so. <laughs> So uh, that's why when we read the Old Testament, uh, we talk about the necessity of putting ourselves in the place of the original audience first, but then when you read the Old Testament, uh, we also read it from a Christian perspective as well in the light of the full revelation and also in the light of our own particular moment in culture and history. All right, so the way I, I presented in this class see if you would agree with this or if you want to take issue with it, is that when we confront Scripture, we need to translate the language, mm -hmm. obviously. We've got to translate the Hebrew or the Aramaic or the Greek. Mm -hmm. We've got to translate the language. But we also have to translate the era. Yes. Because otherwise we run a danger of simply reading the words with our mind yeah. frame. Right. Right. Instead of reading the words for what they originally meant and then trying to understand them within yes. our time frame. That's right. Is that fair? That's right. It's very fair. And it actually begins with the act of translation. I think what, uh, you know, I'll sometimes talk about the necessity of reading the Bible in its original setting. And I'll sometimes get pushback from somebody saying, no, no, no. All I need is my Bible and God. Uh, I don't need you scholars to tell me about ancient Near Eastern setting. And I say, really? Uh, okay. And if I happen to have my Hebrew and Greek Bible with me, I hand it to them, especially if they don't read Hebrew and Greek, and say, well, go at it. Um, <laughs> you need me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the point being that translation is actually an act of interpretation. When we're translating, we are interpreting. Now, fortunately, um, you know... Um, <laughs> you're not being misled by any interpretation. If you compare all the different uh, translations out there, you'll see in terms of the big message, they agree. You're not 
the big message is perfectly clear, even without any knowledge of the ancient Near East or Greco-Roman environment. Yeah, I, I look at this from a, a non-professional um, uh, non, uh, scholastic perspective. But I try to look at it from a practical perspective of me and my friends and family. And, and I see the following. In Scripture, we can very clearly and cleanly understand that we have been made in God's image. Right. That we have marred who we are through mm -hmm. sin. Yeah. That we are in need of a Savior because yeah. sin does bring judgment. Yeah. It's a fact. It's yeah. reality. Yeah. And that Jesus Christ took my sins. He died for me. He brought atonement to me. And he took the judgment that was due me. And by trusting in him, I've got a restored relationship with God that will take some form for eternity. Now, I can get that pretty easy. Yeah. Nobody's going to miss that if they're reading the scripture. Right. The problem for me is twofold. First of all, there are a bunch of people who are more sold on trying to find something wrong mm -hmm. or weird in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And so they will start looking for passages, yeah. and they'll start looking for trouble spots, right. and they'll make a big deal out of it, which means right. we need scholars like you to come in and say, time out, <laughs> yeah. you're not being fair to Scripture. Right. Or we've got people like many in this class who are, just want to plumb into deeper aspects yeah. of God's revelation to us and learn right. more of yeah. Him and what He's done. Yeah. yeah. Fair? Very fair, and uh, the first group I, are engaging in what I call mischievous readings of the Bible. That is, uh, you know, going out of their way to try to find problems in obscure things that aren't essential to salvation. And often, I won't say always, but often they use that as kind of a way to say, I don't have to deal with the claims of the gospel. I had a friend, I play squash, kind of an effete game, but it's racquetball with skill, though I understand you're a racquetball player. <laughs> yeah. Well, we who play racquetball consider squash uh, a, a good beginner's sport. It's kind of like Boy right. Scouts compared right. to the Marines. I yeah. mean, it's valuable. Oh, no. It's valuable, uh, <laughs> but it's not quite the Marines. Go well, ahead. Well, I only played racquetball once, and I beat the guy who was teaching me. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can both agree. Yeah. We can both agree. Squash and racquetball would blow away tennis. Oh, definitely, okay. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. I forgot what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> so I was playing. By the somebody, way, yeah. You know, tennis is mentioned in the Bible. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, Moses served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> nice. Okay. I have to remember that. Go ahead. So I'm playing a guy squash, and, and as the pastor said, uh, it's good to try to, you know, we have the tendency to live in the Christian ghetto, and squash is one of the ways I get out of the Christian ghetto and have friends who aren't believers. And it's amazing how many times they'll ask me questions and one guy basically said, ah, you know, the Bible's full of errors. It's got, you know, he's starting to talk about all the texts that we have, and, you know, we don't even know what it says. And, and, and he's using it as an excuse, you know. So I step in and say, well, actually, no. <laughs> but, um, but so, and then the second group that wants to plumb, yes, that's wonderful. I hope, I mean, 40 years I've been studying the Bible, eight hours a day. It's my full-time job, and I haven't lost the passion for it, A, the interest in it, and every, time, every day I learn something new about Scripture. So, it's a deeply rich thing. Now, the one thing I would say while we're on the topic of what's clear and what's not as clear, sort of secondary teachings, is we've got to be careful about coming to dogmatic conclusions. I mean, we may come to a, an opinion about something, but then to turn around and say to other Christians who have also studied and come to a different conclusion that somehow they're undermining the truth of the Bible. Of course, we'd have to get more concrete, say on women's ordination or even on 
creation issues, to say that somebody, e either somebody who says, unless you affirm evolution, you're somehow wrong, or on the other hand, to uh, insist that it's a six 24-hour literal day, and if you deny that, somehow you're not a believer. You know, uh, we need to exercise some Christian charity and tolerance. I was talking to, in, interviewing Michael Card in this oh, yeah, format. Yeah, right, right. And uh, Michael Card uses this analogy of take a bullet. And he says, if someone says to me, will you deny that Jesus was the Son of God uh, uh, or take a bullet? He says, I'll take a bullet yeah, on that right, one. right. If right. someone says to me, will you uh, uh, hold the fast on this, your view of women's issues, it's kind of like, well, I mean, it's what I believe, but I'm not yeah, going to take a right, bullet over right, it. <laughs> right, right, right. I think that's, <laughs> that's a good way of, of putting it. like, yeah, kill me. I, on this, I will stake my life. <laughs> yes. That's not good. a take Amen a bullet to Michael issue. Carr. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, okay, so I, I want to go back to this now because I'm going to push things a little bit harder and probably upset some of these folks, except they love me. And now that you have given me the entree of it's okay for us to believe some things differently, um, uh, which, by the way, uh, uh, David Fleming is just a marvelous pastor. All of you guys, I cannot tell you enough how careful I am to always talk to him about areas where he and I may see things differently. And I'm always careful to say I don't set policy for anybody except me. And, uh, uh, and, and so this is one of those things. It's not a bullet issue yeah. for me. I could be wrong. Okay, I'm just we'll telling still be everybody. Friends if we disagree, I could be wrong. <laughs> and you guys who disagree with me on this, the last time I brought it up, a number of you sent me emails. I know that y'all, some of y'all disagree with me, and I know some of you don't, and some of you are in the middle. But I believe a very good case can be made that we exist here on this earth. So this is true. <laughs> <laughs> No disagreement yet. <laughs> Though there are some philosophers who wonder about that. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We're not a computer simulation. Yeah. We, we, uh, we exist on this planet, okay? That's Earth. There's going to come a time where we're going to die. And I do believe, and, and by the way, David Fleming agrees with everything I've said thus far. I do believe that when we die, some will go to uh, an eternity with God. And this is uh, a new heaven, new earth. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know what a glorified body is going to be like. I'm not too pushy on that. Didn't okay. Tom Wright set you straight up? <laughs> well, Tom Wright has some very strong opinions yes, on he that. Does. And, he does. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm being very careful in how I word this yes. because I don't want to deviate from... Uh, I wouldn't want, if Tom watches this, Tom, I haven't upset you yet. Um, actually, I don't think I would upset him at all on any of this. No. So, right. so eternity. There are others who go to a place of torment and punishment. And here's where I differ with many. I believe the biblical teaching is that this place of torment and punishment happens for a time, but then there is a second death hmm. that is annihilation. Okay. And these people no longer exist in any conscious form. It is, as in legal terminology, the ultimate capital punishment. Mm -hmm. You're gone. Mm -hmm. You don't exist anymore. You, you know, Jesus said... Don't just fear someone who can destroy your body. Fear someone who can destroy your body and your soul. Hmm, hmm. Uh, this, this, okay, so I'm a, what would be called an annihilationist after a period of torment and punishment. Now, within the framework of this, I have a lot less trouble understanding a God who's going to kill men, women, and children with an understanding that, in a sense, these people will not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. They'll lose the privilege and the honor of and the turmoil of this life. But my question for you is, 
number one, are you an, an, an annihilationist? And if not, then I'm really going to push you on what kind of God will create these people just to kill them and send them to hell. Um, I'm not an annihilationist. Okay, so, so what so kind you're, of God? You're not, you're, 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 not a, you're not a total annihilationist. No, I'm a punisher. Yeah, you're, you're kind first. of a middle, middle road person. I mean, middle, you know, you're... you're I'm not an extremist. You're not an extremist, yes. right. I'm a because, middle of the road. And, and that's because you rightly need to acknowledge that the Bible talks about the fate of such people using metaphors of violence and pain. And some extreme annihilationists uh, point out the truth that whenever their fate is described, it's described using metaphorical language. And they'll say, you know, we don't, you don't really believe that they'll be burned forever and not consumed. And I'll say, no, I think it's metaphorical. But metaphors of violence and suffering and pain point to uh, some comparable idea. And again, I think your view also um, doesn't uh, undermine, you know, what, again, Pastor Fleming was saying this morning, that we need to get out there and share the gospel with people, because whether it's whether it's a difference between torment, punishment, followed by annihilation, and Etern eternity with God, um, we want to get out there and tell our loved ones and other people about the gospel. Yeah, so, th th I don't have the same… Th this it, isn't a good place to go. That is not a good place to go. And even annihilation is not a good place That's to go. That's not a good place to go either. <laughs> yeah, right. No, so, no, no. no. But, so, uh, and, and I will say in fairness yeah. that I didn't always hold this viewpoint. Right. I came upon it not because I wanted to, uh -huh. but because I think the Bible text compels me to it. Okay. Church history and Platonism is what has drawn us away from this, and I think I can show you when in church history it happened to this idea that this, you know, is it an everlasting punishment? Absolutely. There's no return. It's everlasting. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is a punishment that will last forever. It's just not con All right, so my question for you is, if you are not an annihilationist in any way, shape, form, or fashion, so you believe that God has created people with full knowledge of where they're going and sends them there even quicker by command. That's well, a violent God. Well, I'm not so much of a Calvinist that I think that God has created people that I'll he, save that for Piper. Yeah, save it for Piper. <laughs> Actually, Piper's going to get on you about this. I'm not I, mentioning <laughs> this to him. Because when I, to, to be honest, and I've had wonderful conversations with John, uh, mostly about translation stuff, which we disagree about, and he's a wonderful person to talk to. But when I read John, hi, John, he drives me into the arms of Brian McLaren, and when I read Brian McLaren or he Rob drives Bell, he drives me into the arms of <laughs> into the arms of Piper. Yeah, so I'm somewhere in between yeah, the two. That's fair. <laughs> okay, so when you think about God, do you think about God as a compassionate God? Do you think about God as an angry God? Ah. Do you think about God as? Uh, I mean, what? How do you reflect upon God? Uh, I reflect on God. Let me get my reading glasses on here. Um, and what I read in, let me find the right passage here, Exodus 34, which is repeated maybe half a dozen times in various forms in various parts of the Old Testament, where um, he says... Uh, as he passes in front of Moses, he proclaims, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, Give me abounding a verse. in love. Sorry. Oh, sir, it's uh, verse 6, 34, 6, Exodus 34, uh, yeah, give 6. Me a good, good, good. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And then the next part is 
difficult to interpret. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In other words, in my mind, um, it's not an either or question. <laughs> um, and also, I wish I had it with me now, but Mirshav Wolf has this a wonderful quote, which I had in hand yesterday, which talks about how a God who would sort of give a pass, and you're not giving a pass at all, but a lot of people would, a God who would give a pass and not be a wrathful, angry God uh, would leave uh, violence unremedied and the unrepentant violator unpunished, which would be an infringement of justice. So Mirshav Wolf, if you don't know his story, he, was a, he is a Yale theologian who is also Croatian, and he deepened his understanding of justice in this way uh, by experiencing what happened in the conflict between Croatia and Serbia a number of years ago. Um, I'd love to tell you that uh, I'm texting someone, but I'm not. I'm looking up a Bible verse because I can't remember <laughs> yeah. where it is. I thought you were texting it. Piper. No. <laughs> you won't believe what he just <laughs> said. <laughs> um, um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, where does Paul say in Romans? I'll ask you instead. Uh -oh. oh. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Is that Romans 11? No, you're not talking about Yeah, all right. I'm an Let Old Testament scholar. <laughs> you're an Old Testament. <laughs> hey, Siri, where does Paul say? No. It sounds familiar. No, though. no, it's in Romans. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I, I don't remember the... the, the yeah. 12, 9? Well, that's what I thought, but I was just looking at it, and I didn't... I'm, I truly am open to that page. Didn't, there it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so look at this. Mm. Let love, uh, get it, there we go. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Genuine love hates evil. Right. So the genuinely yeah. loving yeah. God yeah. Yeah. is a God who abhors evil. And, and Wolf says something to that effect, that actually a loving God abhors evil and will bring judgment against evil. Well, and, and your view brings judgment against evil, so I'm oh, not... Oh, no, no question. Yeah, yeah. No, look, look I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer first and foremost. I mean, I, I, I believe firmly that every sin must reach judgment. Mm -hmm. I believe firmly that everyone is held accountable for <clears throat> right, their sin. Right, right except for those who have trusted right. Jesus to accept the accountability. Right, right. And um, uh, uh, I, I don't fuss that, but I look at all of this Old Testament era and New Testament era as simply showing God is serious about sin and evil. Yes. It's got horrible consequences in the here and now, and it's got horrible consequences in eternity. Yeah. And that's the saving grace of God. The character of God is that he doesn't leave us all to that fate, mm -hmm. but gives yeah. us all a choice. That's exactly right. Amen. Okay. So we're okay on that. We're, we're definitely okay. And I pity the people who were the women and children who got yeah. massacred. Right. But I got to tell you. This is also going to make y'all recoil. Our attendance next Sunday will probably be like five. I'm going to have my family here, <laughs> Lanier the heretic and the horrible person. In some ways, those people may have been better mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. than, than, you know, we, that's where, again, we're looking at it culturally from our era. Yeah, right. No, definitely. Instead of realizing that they'd have been starving, yeah. they wouldn't have, they, they'd have been abused. They'd have, right. they, they, they walked in a different era right. around different people. No, I, that's really true. And at some point in time, though we don't get it in our <clears throat> cushy lives today. Right. right. Uh, I think often when we think about those issues of women and children, we think in terms of our own culture. And in this new book written by Gregory Boyd that I mentioned last night, he really plays on our emotions 
in terms of those issues, talking about innocent children, which, and again, I, I might not be popular about this either, but the Bible doesn't have a concept of innocent children, um, that yeah. they're all part of a sinful social system that deserves punishment. Yeah, I don't, I don't know many parents who would say they had to yeah, teach right. their children how to disobey. Right, I mean, right. You, you teach right. your children how to yeah, obey, yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> they come by disobedience pretty naturally. Right, right. Um, okay, so uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. No, we're out of time. My watch is slow. So here's where I'd like us to leave this. Okay. Um, you've got three children. They're adults. Three sons and a daughter. No, no three sons. Three sons. They're adults. Um, what is your blessing? What is your, what is your wish and desire and your prayer that most often resonates from your lips for your children? Hmm. Well, the prayer is that they all know Jesus deeply and grow to love him and, and thank God, uh, most of them clearly do. And, and so, um, that's our biggest prayer for them because that's the most important thing. Um, and what was the... And, and, and so your general prayer and blessing over your children. Yeah, which is that they know Jesus, they mm -hmm. love him, they trust him. I know they're going to go and have gone through difficult times. They, they need Jesus. Um, and so that's, that's the... That's really Alice and my heartfelt prayer for them and our four beautiful granddaughters. That's wonderful. Well, I ask you that because I want to pronounce a blessing over oh. all of you who hear this message. And so we're going to, to ask that blessing. Um, uh, and then I want you to join me in giving Trimper some applause. But I'm <laughs> going to stand up to, to bless you guys. Um, Father, I pray a blessing upon all who hear this message. That they will know you deeper. That they will trust you for your loving kindness, forgiveness, but that they will recognize the simple fact that you abhor evil and that you bring judgment upon that which is sinful. And Father, we thank you that our judgment's been borne by Jesus. We praise you for that wonderful act of love and sacrifice. And it changes not just who we are, Father, but, but may it change how we think, how we live, how we treat others, and how we share that to a, a lost world. Thank you for Trimper. Thank you for Alice. Thank you for his family. Bless them as he continues and they continue to work in ministry towards you and the different roles they do it uh, and Trimper through his work as well. Uh, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. God Amen. bless you. Thank you, Trimper. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.